Good afternoon and welcome to this distinguished lecture by Professor Juan Manuel Santos, Nobel Peace Prize laureate and recent pre president of Colombia. This marks the start of his professorship in this university and acknowledges his role as co-founder of the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network. I'm Sabina Alkair of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, a research center in international development, which has the honor to host this lecture. And we're very pleased and grateful that Professor Sarah Whatmore, the head of the Social Sciences Division and Professor of Environment and Public Policy, will chair this distinguished lecture and the ensuing discussion. As head of the Social Sciences Division, Professor Whatmore provides vision and strategic leadership across all the social sciences of the university. Since joining Oxford to take up a statutory chair of environment and public policy in 2004, Professor Whatmore has also served as pro-vice chancellor for education, the university's academic champion for public engagement with research, the division's associate head of research, and as head of the School of Geography and the Environment and she's an active fellow of several learned societies, such as the British Academy and the Academy of Social Sciences. So it's lovely and somehow apt that this lecture involves both a chair who champions public engagement and um, a president who has been engaging research across the social sciences. Um, both can confidently weave uh, uh, this journey between detailed analysis and uh, perceptive and nuanced uh, attention to current events. Such qualities are very needed in these times, and so won't you please welcome Professor Whatmore. Thank you, Sabina, for that warm welcome, and it's a distinct pleasure to be here and to see you all. I'm very absolutely delighted to introduce Juan Manuel Santos, who will be giving this distinguished lecture one of the real pleasures of my current role as head of the Social Sciences Division is to improve, is to approve uh, applications and nominations for visiting professorships. It's a special pleasure um, uh, to uh, welcome um, Juan, Manuel, Juan Manuel Santos um, in that regard. So five years ago, he was serving as president of Columbia and our speaker came to Oxford to launch with Professor Amartya Sen the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network, MPPN, whose secretariat is OFI, the wonderfully acronymed OFI, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, the research centre that organised this event. At that meeting, he endorsed a multidimensional approach to fighting poverty in all its forms and dimensions and ch charged the network here founded to work throughout the world to galvanize concerted force to impact poverty. Whereas 16 countries were present at that time, the MPPN now has participants from 57 countries plus 15 international agencies. Under President Santos's leadership, the government of Colombia was a pioneer in using the multidimensional poverty index as an integral part of Colombia's national plan and in using it to drive policy. As president, he turned his formidable energies and skills to fighting the many disadvantages that blight uh, the lives of poor people. He chaired a round table of ministers engaged in ending poverty in all its dimensions and used Colombia's regularly updated multidimensional poverty index to manage change at an accelerated pace. Multidimensional poverty fell sharply during his term uh, of eight years from affecting over 30% of citizens in Colombia to 17% and many other countries were inspired to innovate similarly in their contexts. Amartya Sen appeals to us not to become coolly accustomed to poverty and destitution, but rather to turn with determination to redress it. And I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished guest as co-founder of the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network, a South-South network focused on ending poverty 
in all its dimensions. Former President Santos also famously turned his indomitable courage to building the peace in Colombia. In 2016, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Juan Manuel Santos for his, and I quote, resolute efforts to bring the country's more than 50 year long civil war to an end. This work required untiring efforts. Even when a referendum had rejected one particular peace deal, this work did not falter, but continued with a strong will and drove an historic change. So we have here a speaker who, like many researchers across the university, is no stranger to complexity, to intractable problems, and to the need for sophisticated and determined efforts and means to solve them. Professor Santos is an economist, and his leadership on poverty especially bears the marks of a curious and rigorous mind. In a university and a division of social sciences focused on the impact of our research in the world, we note with interest that he is also a journalist, thus knows the importance of using scholarship to catalyze action, to change hearts as well as minds. This distinguished lecture opens a new chapter, and I ask you to welcome Juan Manuel Santos to his new role as visiting professor in the Department of International Development at the University of Oxford. And I call upon him now to deliver his distinguished lecture on the title, Reducing Poverty and Building Peace in Colombia, Inextricably Linked Processes. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, it's my honor now to call on the former president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you all for this uh, great opportunity. I want to especially um, thank the, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, and also say hello to all the members of the faculty and all the students. And I feel extraordinarily honored to stand in front of you today. I know that very important people have been here in this magnificent building, and uh, what a pleasure it is for me to be here today. All of us uh, want uh, success and happiness. And uh, very early in life, I asked myself, what is success? Um, what is happiness? And I discovered that it's not uh, how much money you have in your bank account. It's not how much power you have. And I found a marvelous definition that I want to share with you. It's a definition by a great writer, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He says, what is success? It's to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. With this, this definition, uh, I said to myself, what do I do with my life? That's how public service attracted me. And uh, when I became president, 
every leader must have a vision for his country. And I had a vision of a country with three pillars. Peace, social justice, and education. The three are very much linked. I will not talk today about education. Um, I will only say that uh, I made education free for every boy and girl in Colombia from kindergarten to 11th grade. And I put the budget of education as the number one in the national budget for the last five years, first time in the history of Colombia. But let me talk about peace and social justice. Peace was uh, thought to be impossible. We have had a war in an armed conflict, internal armed conflict, of more than 50 years. But I thought that uh, there's no, nothing impossible. Uh, we can make possible the impossible. And how did we go about this? The story starts 50 years ago. I was in the Navy. And uh, in the Navy, I was uh, taught uh, many things. Among them, I became a bagpiper. Uh, the, the British Embassy, our Navy is very much designed by the British and gave us eight bagpipes and I was a recruit and they told me, you have to learn how to play the bagpipe and I learned. But much more important, they taught me how to sail. And uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, there's a phrase by a very renowned Roman philosopher, Seneca, that captures the essence of what I learned. I will uh, quote him, ignoranti quem portum petat nullus sus ventus est, which essentially means if you don't know what port you are steering toward, no wind is favorable to us. I am inclined uh, to a more positive interpretation. When we know which port we are steering toward, even the most contrary winds can help us reach it. This is a lesson for life, for everybody, in your personal life, in your companies, in your families, in government. 20 years later, I found the port of destination, where I wanted to go. The, there are incidents in one's life that in some way determines your future. There were two events. I was recently named uh, the first minister of foreign trade. We had a very closed economy. We wanted to open the economy, and uh, we wanted to attract investment. We made, we organized a conference, a big conference in New York, and in the middle of the conference, with all the potential investors, some news about a very big bomb in a commercial center in Bogota came, and of course, the conference failed. And uh, one of the, uh, the CEOs of one of the big companies uh, said to me, Minister Santos, you will never have important investment in Colombia if you don't end that war. Some months later, I, uh, I was uh, chairman of the 8th Conference of the United Nations for Trade and Development, the UNCTAD. And when my chair ended, I had to give the chair to Nelson Mandela. So I went to South Africa. Um, I had a meeting with him uh, one afternoon. That morning, I, I uh, put on the television, and there was a, an incredible uh, live um, program. The victims and the perpetrators were meeting each other. Some of them were, were shouting to each other, others were embracing. And I thought it was, this was really weird. And uh, I asked Mandela that afternoon, uh, what's it, what is this all about? We had a 
program a meeting for 20 minutes. We ended up talking more than four hours. And he told me uh, exactly the same of what this CEO had told me. You will never have good development in Colombia unless you end the war. And he explained to me what he had done. So there I said, my port of destination is peace in Colombia. So I started to see how can we achieve that peace. I started to, uh, started to plan uh, each step, studied all the peace processes that had occurred in, in, in the world and in Colombia, why they had failed, what lessons could you uh, get from one or the other. There are always different conditions. And we uh, started to discover something very important. In any negotiation, you need the correct conditions for this negotiation to be uh, successful. And you can create those conditions. And I had identified some of those conditions, four conditions, that were necessary to have a successful negotiation and a successful peace process. Uh, very briefly, they were, we needed to have the uh, correlation of military forces in the favor of the state. We needed to have the heads of the guerrillas, the commanders, convinced personally that for them, on a personal basis, it was better to negotiate peace than continue the war. In today's asymmetrical war, uh, in today's world, asymmetrical wars need necessarily the support of, a, of the region and if necessary and if possible of the whole world. And fourth, we needed to um, recognize politically that there was an armed conflict. So I w went uh, slowly building these, these conditions in the, in the first condition, it was simply a matter of making our armed forces more efficient. And in the second condition, we had never been able to touch any of the commanders, the high, what we call the high-value targets. So I came when I was designated Minister of Defense back in the year 2006. I came to London. And I went to the Prime Minister and said, uh, will you help me? And he said, what do you need? And I said, I need what you British have best, intelligence. Please advise me on how to have a better intelligence. And so he sent me to a very distinguished Oxford graduate. Uh, he was the head of MI6, Sir John Scarlett. And he gave me a crash course on intelligence. And I went back to Colombia and did what he told me I should do. He said, you have that American system, which is very inefficient. <laughs> uh, we, we in the British have a centralized system. We don't put the CIA to compete with FBI. No, we have a centralized system. That's what you need, and that's what we needed. And we, start, uh, make it be, which we started being much more effective uh, in, uh, in our in the war, and we needed to weaken the FARC in order to bring them to the negotiating table. The intelligence was so good that we did some fabulous operations. Um, for example, there were six, 15 kidnapped people in the middle of the jungle by the strongest guerrilla, the largest guerrilla of the Americas, and we rescued them from the middle of the jungle without one shot. It was a in military intelligence operation. And uh, I am happy to say that I think uh, it's Ingrid Betancourt here. Oh, here she is. She was one of the persons who was rescued six years kidnapped in a jungle by the guerrilla, Farc the guerrilla. We rescued her thanks in many ways to the way British intelligence taught us to, to uh, make the military operations. And we started striking the heads of the, of the guerrillas, and they, then they were convinced that 
negotiating was better for them. The third uh, condition was uh, done by diplomacy. When I became president, we had no diplomatic relations, no commercial relations, no trade relations with our neighbors, with uh, Venezuela, with uh, Ecuador. Um, with Brazil, we had very bad relations. We changed that all. We changed completely, and we, we created the conditions for the region to support the peace process in Colombia, and after the region, the whole world. Uh, the United Nations, the Security Council, the British were especially, especially um, uh, favorable to the peace process. They became, they became the pen holders in the United Nations, in the Security Council, of all the resolutions that had to do with the Columbus peace process. That's why I'm so grateful for, uh, for what uh, Great Britain has done for Colombia in this peace process. And so we had that third condition. And the fourth condition was uh, the condition of recognizing politically the presence of an armed conflict. That was necessary because we wanted to negotiate, and this is the first time that any country has negotiated a peace process under the umbrella of the Rome Statute. And uh, in order to be able to, to apply what they call transitional justice, which is a different kind of justice, it's, it's designed precisely to facilitate the resolution of armed conflicts, we needed to recognize that there was an armed conflict, something that my predecessor had not accepted. So we did recognize it, and I will tell you a little later why this was also important for the, uh, for the fight against poverty. So when the conditions were there, we then started uh, to apply the necessary tactics. Uh, the procedures. It's very important in any negotiation to have a good process and good procedures. There, I was uh, blessed by the advice of, of uh, five foreign, uh, foreign advisors um, who were with me throughout the whole process. One of them was a professor of negotiation of Harvard University. One of them graduated in Cambridge, and the other three graduated in this university, in Oxford. Uh, some of them are here. Shlomo Benami, who's right there, and uh, Joaquin Villalobos. Uh, they have been my advisors, and uh, um, Jonathan Powell, who was the chief of staff of Tony Blair, very determinant in the North Northern Ireland peace process, was the third one, all of them from this university. So I'm very grateful to the university for the uh, support that we had. And they, they were really good advisors on, on everything, but especially on the process, on, on procedures. And we started to, uh, to say, uh, let's, let's test the willingness of the FARC to really negotiate. Let's, let's negotiate the agenda first, secretly. If they don't filter, if they don't leak the negotiations, then they're serious. We negotiated for a year and a half, and for the first time ever, they never leaked any of that information. We decided to uh, apply something that uh, I call the Rabin Doctrine. Rabin, the former uh, uh, Prime Minister of Israel, when he said, I will negotiate with Arafat as if there is no terrorism and I will fight terrorism as if there is no peace process. And I told the FARC, we will negotiate with the same conditions. They wanted a ceasefire. I said, no, we will have a ceasefire at the end. It was a difficult decision, but I, I think it was necessary. We decided to, um, to uh, adopt the, the scheme that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And there we had some problems because we applied that same scheme to the communications. And uh, the communications uh, was one of the problems that I had during the whole process because um, public opinion 
in every peace process uh, is very skeptical and very critical of any concessions you make to your counterpart. And especially in the case, in my case, that I had been elected president because I was very effective as a hawk. And suddenly I became a dove. And that was a very radical change. I remember the, Mr. Shlomo and I mean, telling me in very crude but real words saying, uh, President Santos, you can, you can continue to be very popular. I had more than 80% favorabilities in the, poll, in, in the polls you can con because you know how to make war. You have been successful. And you can keep showing the trophies every uh, 15 days, every, year, every month. Everybody will applaud and your polls will be very high f for the rest of your government. Or you can risk it all. And you, for certain, will lose your political uh, capital, or your, at least uh, they will be very much diminished. And he said something which was quite uh, uh, shocking. And you can, might even lose your life, like what happened to Rabin and Sadat. Um, but it's the only way you will finish the war. The only way. Otherwise, this will continue 20 or 30 years. And I took his advice, and I went uh, the difficult path. And uh, we started negotiations. Uh, there were other, uh, other factors that uh, were very beneficial. For example, we brought in the military that had always been a spoiler. We brought them into the negotiation. Two of the generals, uh, retired, very prestigious generals, I put as part of the negotiating team. Um, and of course, the negotiation was a very difficult one. But finally, we managed to sign an agreement. And um, something happened. Um, I had promised the Colombian people that the, I would put the agreement on a referendum. Big mistake. <laughs> uh, uh, the Brexit had just happened uh, two months earlier. I should have learned, <laughs> but I didn't. I was stubborn. I thought because the polls all said 20% uh, or 25% or difference, I was going to win. I lost by a very small margin, very small, tiny, less than half, half a per, of a percent, but I lost. And I said, what can I do? Uh, but I said, I, this is a 50-year war. So, so much effort, so much fake news and uh, manipulation of the public opinion in the referendum. Uh, I underestimated the power of fake news. I thought it, they were, the lies that they were saying about the process was, were so outrageous that nobody would believe them. They believed them. And anyway, I said, I cannot simply uh, say I, I declare uh, my defeat and I have to continue. So um, I called the leaders of the no vote they had said that they wanted peace, but another type of peace. And I said, what is it, the peace that you want? We started negotiating. We incorporated many of the suggestions that they had, the big majority. Uh, we renegotiated with the FARC. And we finally signed a new agreement. And I didn't put it to a referendum. <laughs> uh, I, I, the, I was not obliged to put it, uh, legally, I was not obliged to put the uh, peace agreement in a referendum. Our constitution says you have to present it to Congress. I did that, which is the legal way to do it. The Congress, um, the Congress um, approved it by an overwhelming majority. And now we, were, now we are implementing the agreement. Of course, uh, in, in the middle between the date I, I lost the referendum and the, during the negotiation, um, uh, a uh, gift from heaven came, which was the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, that was given uh, not because I achieved peace, because at that time I didn't have the peace in, in, my, in my pocket, but because I'd never 
stop trying to achieve the peace. This is a very important message to you all. We never stop trying, persevering. And that was a very important factor in being able to succeed. It's not a perfect peace agreement. No peace agreement is perfect. It's the negotiation of human beings, two parties that have been at war. Uh, and always, always, in any peace agreement, the key question is where you draw the line between peace and justice. And always, there will be some people who want more peace and some people who want more justice. Uh, that has happened in every single peace process. Um, but the important thing is that we found a, a, what I call a, a correct equilibrium between peace and justice and we're now uh, implementing. Implementing a peace agreement is even more difficult. One thing is peacemaking, and the other, another thing is peace building. Peace building needs a magic word called reconciliation. The Pope, who was also a great ally in this process, I visited him at least five times in the peace process, um, and I always said, if you really want to, to help me, go and give me a push over there in my country. And he said, I will go when I will be most needed, when you will need me the most. And he went after I had signed the peace agreement, the second one. He went and he spent four days in Colombia. And he said, he put the, the title of his visit, I come here to push the Colombians to give the first step towards reconciliation, because that is the most important and most difficult phase of a peace process. That's the phase we are in right now. And uh, we are, I say that reconciliation is like building a, a cathedral, it takes time, it takes patience, and the agreement is a, a very sophisticated and ambitious agreement. It has the normal elements of any agreement, the DDR, demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration of the insurgency into political life, into civil life, but also has a transitional justice agreed for the first time ever between the two parties, and the two parties accept the, they accept submitting to this justice. And not only that, but there's a very ambitious uh, development plan. 15 years, 16 different regions where the communities are the ones that have to prioritize the development plans that has, is been made at this moment. Uh, by the end of this year, next month, it will finish and they will start implementing those development plans next year. So, in the reconciliation, uh, then I go to the second pillar, social justice, the fight against poverty. Again, I go back these, these incidents of life. I go back 43 years. I was a student um, at the London School of Economics, and Professor Amartya Sen was teaching a class that I went to the class. And uh, I remember that class very well. I, I will not go into details, but I was so impressed by Professor Sen. And then I had the uh, luck and coincidence of being his, his, his student also at Harvard back in 1981-82. And again, I was very impressed. So when I uh, recognized the, the, uh, uh, the armed conflict, I did it through a law, a law that uh, put the victims in the forefront of the solution of a conflict. Their, their rights, their right to justice, their rights to reparations, their rights to uh, the truth, and the rights to non-repetition. These are rights that have been established uh, by the Rome Statute. But that law also created a, a special institutionality, institutions that are the ones that I used when 
again, by, by a, a pure coincidence, I was uh, contacted uh, by Oxford, by Sabina, um, and because I was eager to see how I could be more effective in bringing down poverty and extreme poverty and inequality. And I was searching all around, and they told me, well, uh, there is uh, um, uh, Professor Sen, the Oxford uh, uh, Initiative for Fighting Poverty and Human Development, and I said, uh, I, I, I would really like to know more about it. I came to Oxford. I met Professor Sen. I, he, he, I reminded him I was his, his student. He knew how, who I was. And I said, I want to apply your ideas and the ideas of OFI. And that's when we launched uh, the network. And uh, uh, I got very enthusiastic about it. And, and uh, I became uh, a hands-on manager. And I think this is very important because this was as important as the peace process in the sense that it complements the peace process. And uh, if you want to have a durable peace, you need more social justice. You need to bring down poverty and extreme poverty. So what I did was establish a procedure whereby all the ministers that were involved in the different, in the different uh, uh, decisions that addressed the strategy of multi-dimensional index, uh, it was a, a different measurement of how to measure poverty and how to fight poverty, which uh, became an extremely useful tool for the government because then I had a very specific and clear objectives of where to invest. And so I told uh, uh, the Minister of Education, go and do X and Y, or the Minister of Health, or the Minister of Housing, uh, where the investment will have the biggest impact on fighting poverty. So it was a win-win a, a situation from every point of, uh, uh, every point of view. It was an efficient uh, social investment and an effective so it, it, it produced very fast, good results. And we, we uh, decided to continue measuring both multidimensional and monetary poverty. And uh, it had a very, very big uh, um, effect also in the monetary uh, measurement. And relatively speaking, Colombia in the last uh, six years has been the country that has been able to reduce poverty more in the region than any other country and extreme poverty. We still have a long way to go. We still have a, a too much poor people in Colombia uh, and too much uh, extreme poverty. But I think we are on the correct track. I now um, wish to, to become, uh, if, if Sabina gives her blessing, an ambassador for the OFI around the world, because I think that the example of Colombia in the application of this methodology uh, is something that many other countries can benefit from. And I'm very pleased to hear that the interest around the world is there. Mexico, I must say, was the first one to, to identify the necessity of changing the metrics. The Mexican Congress was the first one to uh, approve a law that said that. Um, so we are now, uh, Mexico and Colombia, uh, working together to see if we can promote that in, in many other countries. Um, we brought down poverty in, in a very substantial way, a big percentage, um, and so uh, we will have to continue that in order to also make reconciliation and the consolation of peace uh, more effective. So th those two factors uh, complement each other. You, you have a better social, uh, social situation than the causes of violence uh, 
go down and it's easier to maintain a peaceful environment. So, um, with this, uh, I want to simply tell you, especially the students, um, that uh, you should ask yourself, um, what is and what will be your port, port of destiny, our port of destination? Uh, everybody should have a port of destination and try to uh, fight for it, try to achieve it. Every storm, every foul wind, every force in the universe will help you get there. And uh, I think uh, there are many examples in the world that prove this. Today's polarized world is facing political upheaval, the threat of terror, the threat of war. Um, we see uh, how uh, the leader of the most important country in the world that uh, this country led the creation of the institutions that has maintained the world order for so many years after Second World War, uh, that the leader of that country is now destroying those institutions. And uh, what's going to happen to the world order? We see a China that is emerging, that has already switched from the low profile and bidding time that Deng Xiaoping had as a policy to a much more uh, straightforward policy of I want to be a world power. And they are becoming a world power. You see a Russia that in its, dec in its decline is interested in the world disorder because that will allow Russia to have uh, more space in world politics. Um, just uh, yesterday, these, they were commemorating 100 years of the signature of the, of the Great War. And it's very, very worrisome that if you analyze what is happening today, this national populism, uh, this uh, uh, the, the attitude of, of uh, manipulating the emotions of the people, um, and uh, many of the aspects that we are seeing today are not very different from what the world was going through before the First World War. So, but the answer is not to give in into fear. It's not uh, intolerance and hatred toward those who are different from you. On the contrary, this generation, the generation of your generation, uh, cannot and must not retreat and give in to these regressive and sinister forces. Your generation must lead now, not tomorrow, now. And uh, with this leadership, you must not divide. You must unite. And that leadership must be wise. And at your young age and what you're learning here will give you the instruments to be wise leaders. That is the responsibility you will carry no matter your chosen profession. Your generation must have compassion, something that is very much needed in the world today. Your generation believes in the unifying power of a beautiful word, love. Love should unite everybody. Your generation uh, sees uh, diversity as a strength. And diversity is a factor of strength, not a weakness. You will do the right thing for the rest of us. That's what you should do. That's what we all expect, because you understand that this is not the moment to come apart in today's world. It's the moment 
to come together. This is not the moment to turn away. It's the moment to reach out, especially right now. We have to reach out. This is not the time to disconnect. It's the time to connect. Differences in race, in creed, in sexual preferences cannot distract us from this essential, indisputable truth. We are all, and we can never forget, we are all humans. We are all one. Thank you very much. Thank you for such an inspiring lecture. Uh, Professor Santos has very kindly agreed to answer uh, some questions. Um, and uh, we will give this uh, as, uh, as long as there are questions, uh, within reason, before we move next door to the Divinity School. Um, if I could just ask you uh, if you could um, identify yourself and indicate your affiliation, be that a department or a college, whatever it is. Um, for those on the ground floor, we have some microphones that will come around. Um, for those of you on the upper levels, I'm afraid we can't, uh, in, in a speedily enough way, get microphones to you. So if you could just bear that in mind and speak up, particularly for the benefit of those who are engaging with this um, forum or on live stream. Um, so, please, uh, questions. Good evening, uh, sir. Uh, my name is Eva Engel, and I am a business school student here at Oxford. Uh, my question to you is, uh, you mentioned that there was a trade-off when you decided whether you had to choose peace or justice. Can you look what meaning is if there is peace, they would automatically have justice in a day-to-day -day activity? What was the difference? Why trade-off was required, and why both were not related to each other? Sorry, I didn't understand. The trade-off between peace oh. and justice. It's a par the paradox of a peacemaker. There, always, if you tell an insurgency that to lay down their arms and go to jail for forty years. They will not lay down their arms, the conflict continues. So you need to be more lenient uh, and to apply a different type of justice. Transitional justice is not the punitive justice that we are all accustomed to. It's more of a, a justice that repairs, the, and uh, that's why the victims are so important. Um, Transitional justice, what it, what it does is it, it, it judges, it condemns. One of the conditions for the application of this type of justice is that people have to tell the truth. If they don't, they will go to a normal jail and have a normal punitive sanction. They have to uh, also do a work to repair the victims. For example, instead of going to a, a jail that is uh, the normal jail with pajamas and, and, and uh, lines, you go, you go in and build roads in the areas where you operated, or you build schools, or you go and demine the areas for a certain moment of time, eight years or 10 years. These are the type of punishments that are not in the traditional uh, justice, but they are in the transitional justice. Many people don't like that. For example, in my country, many people object that uh, the leaders of the guerrilla are now in Congress. Right now, I gave them 10 seats 
five in the Senate, five in the House of Representatives. And they wanted, no, no, they have to go to jail before. Well, this is a, a, a very ridiculous uh, demand because uh, if they want to go into politics, and I, I, would, I would summarize the, the Colombian peace process by, uh, with a photograph that was published after the last uh, uh, Congress elections of the commander of the FARC, the commander, by himself, unarmed, voting as the leader of a political party. That's exactly what a peace process is all about. Some people don't like it. As in Northern Ireland, many people didn't like it. And in uh, South Africa, many people didn't like it. Uh, I, I remember President Clinton telling me, telling me that Mandela one time uh, phoned him and said, they're attacking me viciously. And I said, who? Your, your adversaries? And um, he said, no, no, my own people. Because he, they, he was too lenient uh, in order to get an agreement. So there's always uh, a discussion around that issue. This is the most important issue. But it's the only way to achieve peace. Yes, just in front of the brass bar. If you could speak up. No, one behind you. Sorry, just behind you. There's a gentleman behind you, and then we'll come to you. Sorry, he had his hand up earlier. Mr. President, thank you so much for your speech. My name is Arkham Jeskin. I'm doing a master's in comparative and international education. That was very, very young. Um, I really want to hear your comments on education a bit more. Uh, anyways, my question is How long has it been your dream to become the president, and how have you? prepared yourself, you know, what kind of personal preparation have you done and how did you connect with your voters? Thank you. How long did I prepare to become president? Well... <laughs> how long has it been a dream of yours? I, I, Since what age? I, I, had, I had the opportunity of uh, having a lot of experience because I was, um, I was a diplomat for a long time here in London. Um, I was the head of the Colombian uh, delegation to the International Coffee Organization. I was very young. Um, I became, I was then a journalist for some time, and then I became the first minister of foreign trade. Uh, then I, I was minister of finance in the uh, most difficult moment of the Colombian economy in the last 100 years. Um, and I had to take very, very uh, harsh and unpopular decisions. Uh, I thought that that would be the end of my political career because I was the most unpopular Colombian uh, in the whole of the territory. They, they used to burn my picture in every plaza in Colombia and my kids who were very small at the time, they asked me, Father, why do, in the television, why do they burn you all, all, all around the country? I said, because the smoke goes up to heaven and it's a homage to your father. <laughs> then, then I was Minister of Defense, um, and uh, so when I, when I was elected president, I had a, a bit of experience, and it's very important because you don't improvise experience. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello. Um, I'm Venezuelan, I'm studying environmental management here at Oxford. And I wanted, you, you mentioned that one of the preconditions for peace in Colombia was getting better relationships with your neighbors. And I wanted to ask you about Yoren Saleh, who during your presidency was uh, traded or given to Maduro's government and, has, and was in prison for years and tortured. And I wonder if that type of uh, situation was part of the preconditions for peace. No. Uh... I didn't know about uh, this uh, person until he was uh, in, uh, in Venezuela. I'm very um, shocked by what happened to him. Uh, he was tortured, uh, but he was, uh, he was not extradited. He was uh, deported because he was uh, illegally in Colombia. He had, uh, he had uh, been there for much more time than his permission uh, said, and he started to do some things 
according to the police, that uh, that um, uh, caused the uh, one of the senators uh, to accuse him, and so he was deported. But uh, there's there's no transaction of with Maduro. I, I did no transactions with Chavez or with Maduro. And I will tell you an anecdote. When I sat, I, I was probably the, the most, the harshest critic of Chavez before I became president. You can read what I, what, I, what I wrote about him or what he told me, or he attacked me viciously. When I became president, I knew that I needed the region, but I didn't know how to uh, break the ice with this person who had been such an adversary. And I said, uh, I have to use, and this is a, uh, an advice of a great British leader, Winston Churchill, use humor, wit, when you're in difficult situations. And that's what I did. I, when he uh, 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 sent me the message that, or, or I, I sent him the message that I would like to have a normal relations with him because we had no diplomatic relations, no trade relations. Um, he, was, he responded positively. He wanted to go to my inauguration. I said, no, 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 not my inauguration, but I will invite you three days later to a very special place where Bolivar died, up north, uh, a place called San Pedro Alejandrino. When he arrived, he was very flamboyant. And he arrived with four planes, uh, uh, 15 armored cars. And I didn't know uh, how am I going to break the ice with him after uh, so many insults from one side to the other. So when he arrived, he always made a statement to the press. And he took out a white flag and said, I come to to make peace with Santos the day of his birthday. He turns 48. And I saw that in television. I said, I remember the advice of, of uh, Churchill, use wit to break the ice. And when he came and he wanted to embrace me, I was very serious. And I said, Mr. President, we have a big problem. And he was surprised and he said, what happened? Your statements to the press put me in, in, terrible, in a terrible position. And he said, why? I only said I came, I came to, to make peace with you and uh, in a special day, the day of your birthday, you're turning 48. Precisely, I'm, turn, I'm turning 58 and my wife is gonna be much more demanding. <laughs> and and uh, that broke the ice. Uh, we had a very cordial relation, and that same day, that same day, we sat down, and he started to criticize uh, uh, Colombia's uh, social policy and economic policy, and I said, listen, let's do what Reagan and Gorbachev did. Reagan sat down with Gorbachev in Geneva and said, I will never become a communist and you will never become a capitalist, but let's work together for a superior motive. The, in the case of Reagan and Gorbachev was to reduce the arsenal, nuclear arsenal. I said, let's work together for a superior motive, which is peace. And justice and, and history will judge because I will never become a Bolivarian revolutionary and you will never become a liberal Democrat. Uh, but, but history will judge what model is more effective. I think history has made its judgment. You see the situation in Venezuela, which is for us uh, the, the most uh, serious problem for Colombia. We have 2,200 live kilometers of border. We have more than 1 million Venezuelans living in Colombia. We have uh, opened our arms and our hearts to Venezuelans. We will continue to do that, but we hope and we're pressing in every way possible to a peaceful transition as soon as possible in Venezuela. Thank you. Did I see an arm down here? And then I've got two up here, and then I'll come back. Great. Uh, 
Many thanks, President, for your talk. Very interesting. My name is Homero Paltan. I'm a doctoral student from the School of Geography. I just have one question. So this has been a, a, a conflict with uh, regional implications. What has been the level of involvement of, well, apart from Venezuela, from the entire region in this peace building process? And uh, not just for signing the agreement, but what came after or what's happening at present? What's the current level of involvement of all these of all regional institutions. Thanks. No, the, the regional institutions have been uh, very ineffective. Um, and not only with, they, they, they did not participate very much besides giving uh, political support to the peace process. Um, but uh, they, they have been very ineffective because the region is very much divided. Uh, there's no, there's no, um, no coordination among the region. Uh, we have a very awkward situation. We have a, a right-wing populist now in Brazil and a left-wing populist in Mexico, the two most important countries in the whole region. This is a big challenge for us. That's uh, uh, something we have discussed with many of the leaders. I just come from a, from a forum, the Ibero-America Forum, with many of the former presidents saying, how are we going to manage this? Uh, what, is, what, what is going to happen in Brazil? We don't know. Um, what's going to happen in Mexico? We don't know. But, uh, of course, these are the two biggest countries in the region, and uh, we are very concerned of what, what, what might happen. I, in those circumstances, those circumstances, like in any circumstance where you are somewhat lost or don't know where to go, you should always consult your maps. And, and the, the maps are your values and principles. And I think it's, uh, you have to reiterate the values and principles of the democratic government, of democracy, uh, freedom, liberty. Uh, and this is what can ma probably maintain us together. We'll have a sequence of three, beginning with the young man at the front of the top row. Mr. President, my name is Andres Diaz Silva, Colombian, a former MPP and currently interning for Jonathan Powell. So I was very interested about the first precondition you mentioned about weakening the opponent or taking it to the negotiation table. Currently in Colombia, we see a new escalation of violence, especially with the ELN capturing the former FARC areas. If you had an open channel of communication to President Duque, would you advise him to sit at the negotiation table or rather enhance the military action against the ELN to push them into the table? Um, I made a promise to myself not to give advice to President Duque <laughs> and not to criticize him. <laughs> I, I say that there are three types of of former presidents in Latin America. Ones who, the ones who go out of power and want to seek power, seek power again. The second type is the one who goes out of power to criticize his uh, predecessor. And the third one, the ones to go from one university to others telling stories. I'm the third one. <laughs> Next question is here. For those who didn't hear the question, it was um, what are the strategies now to integrate former guerrillas um, into society? That's a very rough translation. Yeah. Um, this is a very, very important question. Fortunately, we had a very long experience in reintegrating combatants of the guerrillas and the paramilitaries. Um, an experience that we have accumulated for more than 10 years. Um, so we know how to do it. In the agreement, 
we were quite uh, ambitious in uh, giving the, the guerrillas um, some uh, opportunities to uh, read, uh, to, to reincorporate themselves into, into uh, civil life. This has been done. Sometimes it takes more, more time than what we thought it would take because, for example, we have a problem with the guerrillas. The leaders of the guerrillas want to have the base together. The base wants to go home and want to be with their families. And so they don't agree on, for example, what type of uh, training they should have. Will they, will they want to be farmers or will they want to be industrial workers? And so problems of this sort has, in a way, delayed uh, the process of reintegration, but it's going on. It's going on, uh, I would say, normally you always have problems Always you have a percentage who go back to, especially with the drug trafficking, uh, to go back drug trafficking because it's very lucrative. But overall, I would say it's working uh, quite well. So we have one sitting there. Yes, you've been waiting a long time. And then we have one over here. Uh, hello, my name is Luisa. I'm doing a master's in international tourism management in Northern Ireland and I'm very happy to, to be here. Uh, I take the opportunity to give a big thanks because I'm from Colombia, from Cauca, one of the most affected regions in Colombia by the armed conflict. And, and I have seen by my own eyes how this peace agreement has uh, benefited my, my region. And I really want to thank you for that because now we have a new hope and, and the, the big task to, to build a new country for this new generation. So my question is, what will be like your message for all these Colombian students, although we are Colombians, <laughs> that, <laughs> that we have like this task to, to contribute to peace building in Colombia? What, what, is, what, is it? what can the new generation do to contribute to peace building? Well, uh, study hard. <laughs> study hard and go back. Go back. Uh, Colombia is full of opportunities. I think we have been building uh, the basis for, for a, a very, uh, I would hope, uh, a very strong takeoff, which already taken off. Colombia, uh, in the last years, has been the country with the best social indicators of the region. We are now going through an a, a infrastructure revolution that is changing the competitiveness of the country. Uh, we have been able to have one of the strongest economies for example, in the last, in the last uh, year, there is the most um, implacable judge of any economy. It's called the markets. They have no heart. And they, when they see something that they don't like, they strike. How do you measure how the markets are seeing you? There's something called the spreads, the risk of investing in, in the country. Well, Colombia is the only country uh, that during this year of upheaval, because you've seen what happened in Turkey, in uh, Argentina, uh, it's been a difficult in Brazil, the only country where the spreads have gone down of all the countries in Latin America has been Colombia. So I think you have to persevere in building the peace, persevere in reconciliation, hopefully, hopefully leave aside this polarization that unfortunately is present in Colombia also, not only in Colombia, almost all around the world, but in Colombia very strongly. You can contribute very much to build the bridges. You come from a university as prestigious as Oxford, the doors will be open. We had a question on the ground floor in this quadrant. I think it's the hand leaning back, wearing glasses. <laughs> Oh, others too. <laughs> okay, um, let's go um, from the back forward. So the gentleman grabbing the microphone now, and then the woman follow can follow on, and then we'll come to you. I haven't forgotten you at the front. Yes, please. Thank you, Miguel Larrota from the Criminology Center. I have a, 
I want to ask you about the decision uh, not to submit to referendum the second agreement. Uh, I understand the reasons why you took that decision, but looking back now, uh, to what degree do you think that decision took away precious legitimacy of the process? And that, in turn, difficult, uh, made it more difficult to, to implement, and that maybe helped create the political environment that, we, that Colombia lives now. We, we made an exercise with the leaders of the no vote and told them to submit all their proposals and their comments. We incorporated 95% uh, out of 58, 58 proposals, we incorporated 56. What, the, what, what were the ones that we did not incorporate? First, the one that said that we should not recognize, we should go back on recognizing that there is an armed conflict. This is ridiculous. This has no, no uh, rationality in proposing something like that. And the second one was that the leaders of the FARC had to go to jail before doing politics. That was also not acceptable. The rest were all accepted. Now, the Constitutional Court, when they approved the first referendum, said specifically, if this referendum is lost, you can present a new referendum. I, I, I mean, if it's lost, you can, you, you can present a new agreement, but to Congress, which is the correct way to go about it as the Constitution stipulates. Because they even didn't like very much that I was uh, calling a referendum for the first agreement. So we did that using our laws, using our Constitution, and abiding by what the Constitutional Court said. And with the uh, approval by an overwhelming majority in both houses, I think uh, the legitimacy of that agreement is not put into question. So we have a final sequence of questions. I think um, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you, Professor Santos. But, uh, so the, w the other person with, with the glasses <laughs> in that quadrant, then we have near the front, and then we have one at the back. So uh, you've got the microphone. Thank you. Thanks for the coordination. Um, thank you for your talk. My name is Patricia, and I'm a student of philosophy here. And I'm interested in the themes of interdependence and solidarity to conversations of justice. And I recently went to a talk by, held by the Oxford Transitional Justice Network about, um, from a South African scholar named Fanny Dutoit, who was talking about his theory of reconciliation in South Africa. And he said that one of the things that he sees as so important in that process was the recognition of interdependence between blacks and whites in apartheid South Africa. And that is something that Nelson Mandela very much brought in to the conversation and made the leaders of the apartheid government realize in order to move forward with that process. And I know that in Colombia, it's a very different situation. It's not one of apartheid, but one of armed guerrilla conflict. Um, but I, there is interdependence between those two sectors of the society, and it's something that comes out in the transitional justice process. So I wanted to hear more what you have to say about the interdependence of, Colum of those members of Colombian society and how that played a role in reconciliation. It's a very good question. Very good question. Um, and um, I will tell you something that's important uh, for ev everybody here uh, because of the, of the meaning that it has. I was, when I became Minister of Defense 12 years ago, I went to a former commander of the Army. He was a retired general at that time. I knew him quite well. He was a friend of my father. For advice, what do you, what do you, what can, what advice can you give me? And he said the following thing. He said, you, I know because you've been talking about this, you want peace here in Colombia. And you are now responsible for waging war, which is a necessary, you have to be effective. And it's a necessary condition to be able to get the peace you want. Treat the FARC not as enemies, but as adversaries. Because the word enemy 
goes against the military honor. The enemy you have to destroy. The adversary you have to defeat. They are Colombians. They're human beings. If you treat them like that during the war, it will be easier to negotiate with them the peace. That was a marvelous piece of advice which I applied since the very first day. We used to have something terrible in Colombia in this war, the Vietnam body count. I changed that completely because I also learned that there is no more important asset for a armed force, for an army, than its legitimacy. And respecting the human rights, even of the adversaries, gives them much more strength. And we applied that since, first, since day one, after uh, I got, uh, I got uh, uh, appointed Minister of Defense, and that helped me a lot. Now, um, for example, I invited the FARC to the presidential palace before leaving office. They are now citizens with rights. They, we have to see them as our equals. We cannot continue to see them as uh, 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 citizens of, of second class. Uh, that is what breeds hatred and be, breeds violence. And we have, to, we have to go through a process of education. Uh, and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time because many people still are, have a different paradigm. But there we must persevere. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Jorge Alejandro, medical doctor from Colombia, health policy researcher, and former Chivin scholar. Um, my question to you is um, What do you think are the incentives for like minded young people to participate in politics? Uh, keeping in mind that there's a lot of personal costs, like the corruption in our countries, also the populism rising in our region. So, why do you think is it worth it for us to participate? Well, to lead that as well. exactly what you're saying. Because we have corruption, because we have all those problems, you should participate. That's the best uh, incentive. Um, if, we, if we want to change things, we cannot uh, simply allow things to go uh, as usual. So, so engage. Uh, if, uh, if, the, if the young people engage, get engaged and, and want to change things, they will change things. Uh, I think there's, you, you're seeing changes in Colombia. The, the last elections, the last Congress, is a big change. There's, there's a, a, the, the, the resurgence of, of new forces um, starting. But uh, you're seeing it. The, the fact that the, the FARC are not present anymore has given the left much more room, political room, before that was not the case. Uh, so I think we can uh, continue to improve. Uh, corruption is, is something that we have to continue to fight. In, in my government, uh, we put in place probably the harshest uh, legal um, tools at the disposal of the different entities that fight corruption. That's why they have been able to discover huge uh, cases of corruption. We have to persevere there. Um, I remember when, when um, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, Desmond Cameron, invited me to co-chair the first World Summit against corruption in London. And uh, we discussed how fighting corruption is so difficult because you fight corruption, you discover corruption, and people think that it's your corruption, corruption that comes from way back. You, you are fighting it, and you have to manage that type of expectation or, or the reality versus uh, what is perceived. But it's, it's a, a matter of persevering also. Thank you. And back row, ground floor. Good afternoon. 
Uh, my name is Tatiana Torres. I am a current master's student, uh, student of global politics at the London School of Economics. Uh, you mentioned that playing the, refer the referendum card as an option was a mistake. The results put uh, the government in a position where you had to negotiate with the position and then include a number of requirements in the peace agreement. Then the peace agreement was signed and you claimed that it was not perfect but that it was certainly the best agreement both parts could get. My question is, if you could go back in time, would you still go, still go through the same process and to get that best possible agreement? Or what would you do differently this time, if, if that were possible? If I would look back, what would I have done differently in the peace process? Well, um, to start in those procedures and, and the process that I mentioned, we decided, for example, to negotiate um, on a sequential basis instead of a simultaneous. That caused the negotiations to prolong a long time and at the end it uh, in a way mixed with a political campaign and that was very bad. For example, I would have changed that. It's always uh, easy to look back and uh, you become a genius when when you look back you're, you're, you always say you, you could have done this this or this other thing better probably this peace process has many uh, many things uh, that are not perfect but as I said it's a it's a product of a negotiation and there's no never um, a perfect peace process. I don't know if you have seen the movie called The Voyage. It's a, a, a conversation between Ian Paisley and the head of the IRA. And at the end, at the end, one says to the other, uh, do you realize that we will be heroes uh, in the eyes of the world, but traitors in the eyes of our own people? And uh, in a way, this happens because of the complexity of making peace. History will, will, will take care of that. But at the very beginning, it's something that you have to live with and manage it and continue building the peace. You're being very generous with your time. I think I'm... Can you manage two more? Sure. And then we'll, we'll call it a close, I think. So I think there's one person over here, and then one person um, with her hand up on the left-hand side of the aisle. What? Hey, sorry, yeah. you, a small confusion <laughs> regarding who was following. Uh, my name is Juan Felipe. Uh, I'm from Colombia as well, from Medellin. And I'm studying, I'm seeing conflict studies in LSE as well. And my question is, what would you think is our responsibility as civil society and your responsibility as a new civil society member uh, to work towards reconciliation in our country, especially with such polarization that we're seeing right now? Um, I think that there's a lot that everybody can do on trying to uh, change that polarized atmosphere. Um, first, even the, the use of the language. You know, it's very important to use a, a more uh, agreeable language referring to your, adversar to your political adversaries. Um, I would say that it's very important to, um, to go back to those uh, subjects that should unite the whole country, uh, regardless of politics. It's always very important for a society to, to have common denominators. And uh, uh, I, I would suggest very strongly to, uh, to recreate those common denominators and try to see if we can have a minimum consensus on those issues. That will facilitate the political, um, uh, the political 
management of the country because what we're seeing now, not only in Colombia, we're seeing it everywhere, is that polarization is uh, making politics a zero-sum game. And a zero-sum game is the contradiction of politics. Politics is transaction, is compromise. Zero-sum game is I take all or you take all. And then there's no compromise. And if there's no compromise, uh, then politics loses its, its uh, reason to be. So we must recuperate the art of transaction and compromise in politics. And that is by, one, one way to do it is by identifying those common denominators that, uh, around which we can all agree to. And the last question, I think you're holding the microphone. Thank you so much, Professor Santos. Uh, Laura Pereira, former student of geography here. Um, I wanted to ask a question about what you think of the viability or the long-term viability of the peace processes, um, given the context not just of poverty, but also of inequality. And that's sort of taking lessons from my own country of South Africa, where you see um, sort of after transition 20 odd years down the line, where the underlying causes of conflict haven't actually been addressed, and that's starting to actually um, rise up again. Sorry. Okay. If I understood correctly, how does inequality uh, and peace uh, play each other? I, I, I'm sorry, but I didn't understand very well. Oh, okay. Okay, now, now I understand. That's why I said at the beginning that fighting poverty and equality is a, is a perfect complement to peace and to make peace a durable peace. Uh, part of the reconciliation of the country is precisely to uh, lower the, the levels of inequality. Uh, inequality um, breeds hatred. Uh, there was a, a, a study published uh, about a, a week ago, I saw it in one uh, American newspaper, that, that says how inequality has fed hatred in the United States in, in, a, in a very determined way. So um, in the long run, we must do every effort possible to bring inequality uh, down. And that's one way to do it is to uh, fight poverty and extreme poverty. Now, there is a problem also. And this is a, a, a collateral problem that uh, many, many countries are having. When you bring people out of poverty, you take them out of, of a trap that they, they, were in, they were in and they had resigned themselves. They had, they, they had thought for, many, many, for a long time that they were destined to be po poor. When they are, come out of poverty, they, are, they have rights and they, they understand that they have rights and they want to exercise those rights. And the demands increase exponentially and the capacity of the governments to satisfy those demands is always much lower. So there is a, a one area where, where um, we have to invent ways to see how we can channel the demands of the middle class when poverty alleviation is very successful and uh, the numbers are very high in the short run. Uh, this is a big challenge uh, for a university like Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, my apologies to those of you whose questions I either didn't see your arms or that I've not been able to fit in, but I think um, Professor Santos has been 
uh, extraordinarily generous with his time. I think we've kept you talking for at least an hour and a half. Um, I'd like to invite you, please, to join me in thanking him, both for that generosity, but for that very rare thing, which is seeing uh, somebody bring together the skills of a politician. I hardly dare use the word statecraft in our current uh, climate and context here in the UK, uh, but statecraft together with um, a real appreciation of the research, the analysis that underpins sound policy making. So please join me in thanking him for a, a really inspiring lecture. Thank you. Thank you.